Well, let me ask you to open to two places tonight. Let's get uh, Matthew chapter 24. Again, I, is, that, is that up? Am I on? I can't hear that much. There we go. Okay, Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 12. And then in your right hand, you get Revelation chapter 2. Please. Revelation chapter, or um, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 24 and Revelation chapter 2. And we'll read Matthew 24 verse 12 to begin with. Jesus is giving what we know as the Olivet Discourse here. And he's answering the question as to what it's going to be like in the end times and in the end of the world. And uh, if you keep up with how the world is going and you read your Bible, I think it doesn't take much imagination to see that we're in the end times, right? And uh, if nothing else proves it, verse 12 by itself can prove it, I believe. Matthew 24 and verse 12, Jesus said, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And I'd like to speak to you tonight on that subject at the end of the verse about the love of many waxing cold. Come to Revelation chapter 2, Revelation 2, and we're going to talk about the first love that Jesus mentioned here. Revelation 2 and verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. That's a very powerful verse. If you really let that sink in for a little bit, Jesus says, I know what you're doing. I know why you're doing it. And I know the patience that you've had to display. A lot of people hate you for the position you hold. That's what Jesus is telling this church. They do not, nobody has ever hated Christians for their humanitarian deeds that they do. What's wrong with feeding the hungry? Does any group in the world have a problem with that? What's wrong with visiting the sick that are in the hospital or in prison? No one has a problem with that unless you do it in the name of Jesus. And then all of a sudden it becomes an issue. And this church was handling those persecutions patiently. And at the same time, they had a no compromise attitude when it came to the truth. If somebody said something contrary to the Bible, they didn't hesitate to point that out. In verse number 3, he, Jesus continues talking about what he knows of this church and has to born and has patience. That is, they've put up with the persecutions. And for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. So you haven't quit. He acknowledges that. But here comes the problem. In verse 4, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. You never want to get to that place in your life, do you? Where Jesus says, I appreciate this and this and that, but there's this one thing we need to talk about. There, there's something I, I have an issue with you on this. I wonder tonight if you came trying to hear from God, if he might tap on your heart and say, here's the issue. I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. He said, that's the issue. We used to be in love. And it was a special kind of love. And he says, that love is dipped down into a place I don't want it to be. And in verse 5, he, he's not done with them, right? He says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So just for the next few minutes, by the grace of God, we're going to talk about that first love, that first love. Let's bow our heads, let's pray together, and we'll get into this sermon tonight. Father, please help us tonight. Lord, speak to our hearts. Please remind us, show us, God, if we have fallen out of that first love. Show us where we need to get back to. God, please, please don't leave us to ourselves. We believe your promise. That you said where two or three are gathered together in your name, you'd be in the midst. Now, Lord, we want to enjoy that presence. We, we hear you knocking at the door. Please come in, speak to us, sup with us and us with you. Lord, make it real tonight. Let us leave this building better than how we came. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now verse 4, 
There's no doubt about what the problem is. He says, thou hast left thy first love. I think this goes hand in hand with what Jesus said in Matthew, the love of many waxing cold. I, I, I don't know if this is uh, scientifically true, but uh, this is my own observation. I, I think there are some various stages that, that a loving relationship goes through. I think we're a good place to be. I've written on my paper here a passionate love. And then I have all these great adjectives I came up with. Fervent, eager, hungry, desirous, real, invigorating, compelling, earnest. Anybody else got some other adjectives? We can throw them in there, right? I, I think you're getting the picture. This is, a, this is a real love where you actually are motivated by that person. You may not swoon every time they come in the room, right? You may not have stars pop in your eyes every time you see them. Uh, we kind of think of that as more of a puppy love type of thing, you know, a first impression, which is great, by the way, which is great. But, but as time goes on, we may not expect that same puppy love type atmosphere in a long-term relationship. That doesn't mean, though, just because your love matures and you manifest it differently, that doesn't mean you don't have a real love. Does that make sense? My wife and I have been married 20 plus years now. I love her more than I did the day I married her. I love her more than I did yesterday, but I don't show it the same way I did when I was 18. Thank God. <laughs> that would just be weird. Not to mention very awkward. But it's a real love. It changes the way I feel about other things. It changes my schedule in the day. It changes the way, it changes my life. It affects me. It moves me. She means something to me. That's the passionate love, if I can give it that title. A real love. And then I think things, when they t start to cool off, we get into a tolerant stage, a, a tolerant love. And if you are not that old and maybe haven't, you're not married or something, and maybe you're not so clued into this, but those of you that have been around a little while, I'm sure you understand what I mean by this. After a while, you get used to the other person living in the same house as you. And you know they're there. They know you're there. But that's about the extent of it. You tolerate their presence... And you don't mind going through the motions of living in the same house and sharing a roof and taking care of the chores and making sure life goes on, but it's more of a toleration. You're really not enjoying each other that much, if at all. And then I think there's one last stage to it, and this is where you, I believe, again, you can rename this if you'd like, I would say there were people fall out of love. We generally don't go from being passionately in a real love to boom out of love. It, there's, there's a little bit of, of a, a gradual process where it waxes cold. It takes time to cool off. We go from being enthralled by them to, yeah, there you are. Oh, it's you again. <laughs> yeah, I can put up with that. That's not so bad. You're, you're, not, you're not that much of an irritation yet. But then at the end, you just get flat out irritated with that person. Every time they step in the room, you want to leave it. Every time you hear their name, it just gets under your skin and it just bothers you and they get on your nerves, you get on their nerves, and all of a sudden you, you don't want to be anywhere near them. With the passage at hand, I don't think that we have reached that irritation stage. Not in Revelation 2, not, not in verse 4. He says, you've left your first love. Jesus doesn't say, now get out of my sight. If I had to guess, that first love, that's that passion where it's real, where he affects your life, where he affects your thinking, where you get up looking forward to spending time with him that day. But then after a while, the people got used to the idea of Jesus and they continued to go through the motions of a Christian, but they lost sight of Christ in the Christian. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 23, you don't have to turn there, but Barnabas went to visit some new Christians at Antioch. New Christians. You remember when you were a new Christian, how exciting that was? You remember how you couldn't wait to get to church? You remember those days where you didn't have excuses for not coming? You remember that? Where nothing would stop you. N nothing got in your way. You remember that? I'm asking you, do you remember that? it was an absolute pleasure 
to be around God and God's people and God's book and God's songs, man, that was just wonderful. And it thrilled your soul. Barnabas went to Antioch and there's a bunch of new Christians. And this is what he told them. He, he, he showed up, he saw the grace of God. Anybody want to point to the grace of God for me? Benzel, point to the grace of God. Where is it? Do you see it? There? <laughs> there, there, good answer. He points to his Bible. Where is it? How do you see the grace of God? You see God working in the people. That's where the grace of God is manifested. You see God doing something in people that they could not do by themselves. That they cannot manufacture. You can't drum it up with good music. It's not, it's not something that's fabricated because of fancy gimmicks. But something real emanating from the people from a very deep and real place in their heart where Jesus abides. Barnabas showed up and he saw that. He saw the grace of God and he exhorted them all. And the Bible says, he exhorted them that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Listen to that phrase, with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. The first time I remember reading about that, that word, cleave in the Bible, how many of you remember Genesis 2.24? Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. The first time that word is used in my recollection in the Bible, it speaks of a man cleaving to that one that he loves more than any other woman in the world. You should say amen right there. <laughs> cleaving to her. Why give that command? Because God knows that's going to be a challenge. Cleaving is sticking close together. The world is going to throw everything it has at you to split that apart. How many couples get married in the first few months, years? Man, we're good until life starts to happen. And you start to collect things. You buy things. And there's a mortgage and there's a car payment and you got work and she's got work and then kids and more kids and kids and more kids and kids. And then kids get friends and then mom's doing this and dad's doing this and all of a sudden you're living two separate lives under one roof and you've reached the toleration stage and you, don't, you didn't even know it. And life, not, not even a sinful life, life got in between the two. It's going to take some work in any marriage. Any marriage. It's going to take work to cleave unto your wife. It's going to take a concentrated effort to make time to stay in that first love. Do you understand? I'm not talking about how you manifest it. I'm not talking about the goofy little things you do to say I love you. How many of you, when you first fell in love with, with, the, with your wife or your husband, did you ever have this conversation when you were younger? I love you, but I love you more. But I love you more. But I love you more. Have you... Oh, come on. Some of you haven't had that. Yeah? I've had that. I win every time. <laughs> As if there's a winner, right? Now... That, 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 that might sound like something for the younger generation, the younger people to do. So you get older, why, why have it? Why not have it? Why not have it? Where does it come from? It comes from a very good place of me trying to show you how real this is. So I'm not telling you that you have to manifest it a certain way all the time. You understand that? Not everybody, not everybody's going to manifest their love the same way. Not everybody in church is going to shout up, Amen every time. But that was a very well-timed amen. <laughs> not, ev not everybody expresses it the same way. That doesn't make it any less real. Does that make sense? And I cannot climb inside of your heart and see how real it is. I can't. Wish I could, but I can't. So this is something where you're going to have to do some self-examination and look in your heart and ask yourself, is this, am I doing my best... Even though life is throwing everything it has at me to distract me, choke the words so that I don't bring forth fruit, am I, am I doing my utmost to cleave unto the Lord? Or am I allowing those things to come between me and the Lord, 
thinking I have a good reason for not being madly in love with him like I was at one time, for not allowing him to influence every thought of my life. How dare I start making decisions in my life not taking my wife into consideration, not taking my kids into consideration, these people I dearly love. If I love them, I have to keep that in mind. How many decisions have you made this week where you didn't even consider one time how it affected Jesus? You didn't ask him what he thought about it. You didn't ask him how he felt about it. Even while you were doing it, after you're doing it, it never even crossed your mind that he may not like it. If that's the case, you might have moved out of your first love. And you might just be hanging out in that toleration stage. And I want to admonish you tonight. I want to exhort you tonight that with purpose of heart, you cleave unto the Lord. That might require leaving some other things. Isn't that where it started? Leave father, mother, cleave to the... Isn't that where it started? You might have to say goodbye to some things that aren't necessarily wrong, but you may not be able to spend as much time with those things because you're making time for that person who's so, so important to you. Can I, can I ask you to... You can hold Revelation. We'll be right back to it. Can you find 1 Corinthians chapter 7? I'd like to show you another verse about marriage, but you can already see how it applies to our topic tonight. 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 5. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 5. Paul says, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. He's speaking to a husband and wife. Saying, guys, you need to spend time physically together is what he's talking about. Don't hold out on each other. Defraud ye not one the other, except, except it be with consent for a time. Why? That ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempts you not for your incontinency which is your lack of sexual control say so, brother Mike what does this have to do with our topic you know I, th this is good advice if a couple finds themselves falling into that toleration stage and life has gotten a bit hectic go away on a vacation together take a few days just to pull away and spend with each other that's great advice Take off from work. Do it on a Wednesday, a Thursday, and a Friday. You, you, you say, why? Boy, you really mean it if you're knocking off from work to do it. What a sack. Whoa, that didn't go over very well. <laughs> I thought it was good advice. You can text Saturday and Sunday on there too. I'm just saying, take some time off from work to do it. I love it. I love it when you guys take those points so harshly. <laughs> You're so cute when you get offended. <laughs> How dare he say take off work? Doesn't he know we spell God W-O-R-K? <laughs> I'm getting in deep trouble. I've got to move on here. <clears throat> a couple goes away on a bit of a retreat. I think that's great. I'm advising you to do so. When you feel the relationship not where it needs to be, you pull away from everything else and take special time together. Amen, right? Doesn't that make sense? That's an amen. That, that's good. You, do you have a relationship with the Lord? Right? When you feel that it's not where it needs to be and you're not as close as you ought to be, do you ever schedule a retreat with Him? Ever crossed your mind to take a day or two off of work just to spend extra time with Him? beyond that obligatory time on Sunday that you squeeze into the schedule grudgingly. Special time. I, I remember reading and hearing, I've never met one of these men personally, I'd love to. Men, men that would feel the presence of God leave. Um, imagine that, that you could actually feel it leave. Have you ever felt it leave? That's a devastating thing, to not feel the Lord around you. Oh, man. These men would be so keenly aware of that, that when it happened, they would take a jug of water, walk off into the woods, and come back two weeks later. They'd just go out there and pray and fast. 
That's why I showed you this verse. Paul says a man and his wife ought to be spending consistent time together, physically. Except, except whenever they need to go on a retreat with the Lord spiritually, take some time to pray and fast and just concentrate on that. I think that's a, a biblical precept that we could all employ to make, to carve out some extra time in the schedule beyond what the church offers you. Beyond the church services, beyond the prayer meetings and all of that stuff, just you saying, God, you're so important to me. I want to get our relationship right back to where it needs to be. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 2. Let's take a look at verse number 4 and 5 and dig in a little deeper here tonight. Revelation 2 and verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. As I've already pointed out, but let me just be clear on it, I, I don't think Jesus is saying that you've, you've fallen out of love altogether. It's just not where it needs to be. And, and then he says this in verse 5, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Not, out of, not fallen out of love, but fallen from the first love. And Jesus says, remember. Remember. He's trying to remind you of it. He's trying to jog your memory. Can you think back to when you first fell in love? I remember when I first met Christine and how wonderful those, those days were. They're still wonderful, amen, but those, first, those days will stick with me forever because I worked at McDonald's at the time. I was a manager at the, at the local McDonald's. And Christina, she would, she would come up to the McDonald's. She'd have her mom drive her through town. And uh, she would write me a note. These are, these, this is before text messaging. Did you know that there was a time when we didn't have cell phones, right? No text messaging, nothing. And, and so we had to actually write the note with our hands on paper. And, and then we had a fancy way of folding it. H have you guys ever seen a fancy note folded? If you fold it just right, I can even show you now. You fold it up just right, and then you tuck that part in, and then if you really love him, you put a little heart sticker on it, you know, so just to seal the deal, something real cheesy like that. So she would come in, and as soon as she'd walk in the McDonald's, I'm having the worst day ever, she walks in, and my face lights up, and oh, my girlfriend's here. And I'd run out of the kitchen up to the front counter and she'd slide the note across the counter. <laughs> I got a note. And I'd stand back there in the kitchen reading my note. Four, five, six pages saying what? I really like you. <laughs> You're really great. <laughs> That's all I heard. <laughs> That's all I got out of it. I can't stop thinking about you. I'm thinking about you now. I'm like, well, yeah, you're writing the note. <laughs> so then I'd go home and I'd write my response and then I'd, I'd have it next time she came, she'd come by the McDonald's just so I could slide my note across the counter back to her. It was, those are the good days, man. I'd get home at 10, 30, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night after closing the restaurant and I'd call her. We'd stay on the phone until 2 or 3 in the morning. Oh, those are great days. She said, what'd you talk about? Well, not much, really. <laughs> Have you ever done this? You're so tired that you just sit there and you say, I'm falling asleep, but I don't want to hang up. No, I, no, 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 it's fine. No, no, you, will, will, you, you sleep on that side, I'll sleep on this, it's fine. Oh. I love you so much, I just, I just don't want to be away from you. I'll, I'll just be on the phone with you. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. That makes no sense. Hang up and go to bed. You're so delirious, you don't even know what you're saying after a while. We'd get to go out on a date. We'd stay out as late as possible. It's amazing how many times my car can break down on date night. Because, <laughs> you know, her mom and dad says, you've got to be home at such and such a time. Right about that time, boom, car breaks down. <laughs> Not my fault. I've got to stay out longer. <laughs> Very convenient. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry for the teenagers in here. Don't try that. Don't use that. I already used it. You can't have it. Those are good times. And you know, some, sometimes it doesn't hurt to just go on a date. And her and I, we like to talk about those days and how silly and goofy and special it was. And we kind of relive it. 
It does you good every now and then to remember where it all came from. It, it, it helps remind you of that purpose. Right? Cleaving unto the Lord with the purpose of heart. What made it so special? Let's talk about how we met and what our intentions were then. And, and let's talk about where, what we've been through and our experiences in life. And it, it, it does you some good to think about that. Do you remember what happened right after you met the Lord? Oh man, I remember those days. That was good stuff. I'd stay up till 2 or 3 in the morning studying my Bible. Christina's tired and she'd go to bed. I'd stay up. I'd have a concordance on one side. That's the, a concordance has every word in the Bible. It's like a dictionary, sort of, and then it tells you where every word in the Bible is found. So if you look up the word resurrection, it'll give you every verse. I sat there night after night making notes and running references and wake up the next morning, two or three hours of sleep, go to work. Didn't even care how tired I was. As soon as I knock off from work, go to the pastor's house, fold tracks, pray with the pastor, go out witnessing two or three hours, come back, ask the pastor all the Bible questions I'd gotten from the night before. And we did that day after day after day, seven days a week. That's what we did. Christina and I, we, we were at the church so much they gave us the key. I kid you not. Because Brother Freddie, our pastor, needed somebody to clean the church on Saturday night to get it ready for Sunday morning. Hey, we'd love to. We we're scrubbing toilets and cleaning the kids' puke off of the crib mattress and, and we're straightening up the song books in the back of the pews and we're vacuuming the pulpit area. We're, oh man, we loved it. And then because I felt as if God was calling me to preach, I'd only been saved about two or three months, but figured God might want me to preach, so I thought I'd practice. 10.30 on a Saturday night, we get done setting up the church. You guys think you have it bad. We finish our setup at 6 p.m., then we have prayer meeting. We, her and I did it by ourselves till 10.30 at night. And then I'd say, all right, honey, get comfortable, I'm going to preach. She'd say, all right. And she'd lay down in the pew and go to sleep. <laughs> A little too comfortable. <laughs> and I remember the very first sermon I ever practiced. I even, t I, the, back in the days, how many of you remember cassette tapes? How many of you are that old? I bet, I bet, the mo I bet most of you don't even know how they work, right? But... <laughs> But you had to open up the door, stick it in, click record, and when it got to the end, click, and then you'd have to take it out and turn it over. That was back in them stone ages when you actually had to turn it over with your hand. I, I, I'd preach until it clicked and then have to flip it over. The very first sermon I ever preached like that was called The Three Stooges of the Bible. <laughs> Pathetic sermon. <laughs> Horrible sermon. I've never preached it since. But I, 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 I recorded it because I wanted to hear myself and see how good it was. I got home and listened to about 10 minutes of it and said, I don't know if God wants, wants me to preach. <laughs> That's just horrible. No wonder she went to sleep. Now, now, I don't do the same things now that I did then. Right? But I want the same passion to drive me to do what I do now. It helps me to remember how madly in love I was with the Lord and why I was so in love with Him. He saved me. He washed me clean. He told me I was forgiven. He gave me peace in my heart. He began to speak to me. He began to lead me as, as a shepherd does his sheep. He, he began to take care of me and comfort me. And, and He began every time I go through a hard time to show up and help me. I don't ever want that to grow old. Jesus said in verse number 5, remember. You know what that tells me? He hasn't forgotten. It means something to Him. He hasn't forgotten. Now He wants you also to remember. Remember when, when we met? He's, he cries out, you remember that time where you were going through a bad time and then we talked about it and I helped you through You remember that? He hasn't forgotten. It's still very real to Him. He just wants it to be real to you. Can I ask you to hold this and grab Jeremiah chapter 2 in your left hand? Let's look at this quickly. Jeremiah 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. And verse number 1, Jeremiah 2 and verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, 
Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee. Doesn't that sound like Jesus? I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals. You say, what does that mean? That when you were in that engagement stage, working up to marriage, he says, I remember that love that you showed me then. Remember those days? God does. I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. He said, we didn't have much. The land, it was just a wilderness, but boy, we got on real well. You talk to me, I talk to you, and we enjoyed being around each other. He says, remember those days? He says, I do. Verse 3, Israel was holiness unto the Lord. So what's that mean? Israel said, God, I'm all yours. The whole thing, the yielding, I'm all yours. Holiness to the Lord. And the first fruits of his increase. Israel said, not only me, but everything I have. No matter what it is, God, it's yours. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. That's a strange thing to put there. God says, back in these days when we were madly in love, if anybody came to attack you, I would punish them. You know what's so strange about when God is saying this now? God is now bringing the other nations to attack them. He says, I remember the day that I protected you. We were so madly in love. If anybody touched you, I would punish them. And now you have gone so far away from me that I'm actually inviting them to punish you to get your attention. Verse 4, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Folks, you really need to hear this part. What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? In plainer words, God's saying, What did I do wrong? Why did you decide to waste your life on all of that stuff? What did I do wrong? In verse 6, Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt? They forgot about their redemption, their salvation. Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt? They forgot all that God had done for them. All those past experiences, gone. Verse 7, And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. He says, after you got settled in and you started gathering some stuff and the hooters begin to pile in, all of a sudden the stuff, the stuff became the thing that you love. And you forgot me. In verse 8, the priest said not, where is the Lord? The religious leaders no longer seeking God. And they that handle the law knew me not. The personal relationship was gone. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Part of the problem, he says, is your religious leaders. I'm going to share a bit of my heart with you. I hope that's okay. I hope you don't hold this against me. But when I see somebody's heart grow cold, I can't help but feel responsible. Because I'm your pastor. How, why should I be comfortable with that? Why should that not touch my heart? Why should that not concern me? Shouldn't it concern me? When I see people that were at one stage madly in love and now have cooled off and their love is wax cold, that should concern me. It should concern me especially when I find it in my own heart that I've gone into the toleration and go through the motion stage. God forbid, if I'm doing it, how can I possibly help you get to where you need to be? 
Come back to Revelation chapter 2. He says, remember. First thing, remember. He says in verse 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. That's the second thing. Remember and then repent. And do the first works. Now, if you can see in verse number 2, he says, I know your works. Do you see that? I know your works. They hadn't stopped doing the works. But now he says, repent and do the first works. But they didn't stop doing the work. What do you mean do the first works? It's not what you're doing, it's why you're doing it. He said, I want you to get back to where it wasn't a burden but a privilege to get to do these things. Repent, the word repent means to change your mind. To change your mind. Once you change your mind, it'll change your hands and your feet and how you do things, what you touch, where you go, all of that. But first you've got to change your mind. Jesus says, repent. I want you to change your mind about this. The works are fine. I have no problem with your works. It's why you're doing it. You might have to convince yourself tonight and say, maybe my love isn't where it needs to be. Maybe I should not be satisfied with just tolerating Jesus. I think in chapter 3, he gets to that point. Chapter 3, verse 17, he tells the church of, of the Laodiceans, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, th th there's the chuters, and have need of nothing. That's where these people had reached. They said, well, we got plenty, we're fine. No, no, we don't need a, an intense, passionate relationship with you, Jesus. We're good, we got, we got enough. They needed to be convinced that their love had grown cold. He says, repent and get back to those first works. Not the what, but the, but the why. As, as my Christian life has gone on, what I'm doing has changed. To, to some degree, right? The principle of it is the same. I'm trying to witness to people and praying and reading and stuff. All that stuff has stayed the same. But my schedule has changed a little bit. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't have counseling sessions with people and so forth when I was just saved. I wasn't running a church when I was just saved. Things have changed a little bit. But what I've got to be careful for is that I don't, I don't fall into the rut of doing it because, well, that's what I do now. It must remain a privilege. Lastly, let's look at this in verse 5. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else... I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. Jesus said, remember. Then he said, repent. Now if you don't, he says, I'll remove. I'll take your candlestick. He said, I'll show up quickly and I'll take the candlestick. I'll remove it. He said, what's the candlestick? The candlestick is the church. In Revelation 1 verse 20, you can see that. The seven golden candlesticks are they, they are the seven churches. So he says, Ephesus, if, if, if you're going to go on in this condition, I'm going to show up and close the church. If that seems harsh, it's harsh because our worldview is wrong. The way we view the church is wrong. We take it lightly as if, well, if we tolerate it, no big deal. If Jesus is a secondary thing for us, no big deal. Hey, just, you know, God's patient, he'll put up with me. And God says, I will for a while, but uh, I'm not going to let you just go through the motions forever. It's either hot or cold or I close it down. How, how serious should we take that warning? What do we do about that? Folks, what do you want me to do about that? No, no, I'm asking. What do you want me to do about that? Should, should we just go to chapter 3 and see if there's a, a, nicer, a nicer warning there? <laughs> Maybe we'll find some blessings in Psalms. <laughs> right? The Lord is my shepherd. There's green pasture there, right? <laughs> but, but there it stands. I, I think the right way to explain this is the outworking of history. So let, let me explain this very quickly. Anytime God does something, it starts with a man. 
An, an individual, let's say, but, but a man, okay? One man. God gets a hold of one man. One person. And that person falls madly in love with God. And from that, it's contagious and it spreads to others. And that man, that love that he has, turns into a movement. Let's, let's work it like this. Jesus shows up. And then he begins to teach and preach and tell people how to know God, how to love God. And eventually he starts sending out apostles. There go the twelve. There go the seventy. There goes the New Testament church, right? A man turned into a movement. This make sense? And the movement is doing exactly what the man did. Telling people how to know God. The danger... Now, the man and the movement, we have no problem with. That's how it works. That's the way it should be. The problem is when you get to the third stage. When the man has passed on, the movement loses its momentum and it becomes a machine. And now, without purpose of heart, without thinking about it, they can just do the same things that the movement did. It looks the same on the outside, but there's no heart to it. A machine can't feel. So it's just doing what it's programmed to do. It looks right, but it's not alive. And when we reach the machine stage, Jesus says that's dangerous because the next step after that, it turns into a monument. Pretty soon the machine will break down. People will stop doing the work and they'll never even try to fix it because they forgot why they were doing it in the first place. So then that machine just sits there as a monument. And you know what has to happen after that? God has to send another man to start it all over again. It's all right. Everybody's forgotten what it's all about. Let's find somebody that's fired up for the Lord and maybe get this thing going again and it gets back to the man, the movement. And that has how, that's how the history of the church has played out since day one. Jesus says, if we get to the machine stage, I'm afraid that it's going to be a bad testimony. All of a sudden, we're going to have people running around calling themselves Christians that have no idea what it means to be a Christian. We've reached that. The majority of the people that I speak with, when I ask, are you a Christian, they say yes, and I say, how did you become a Christian? The vast majority of them do not know how to explain how they became a Christian. The vast majority. And those of you that win souls, I see you nodding along with me in the room tonight because you know that's the case. I, as you might know, I was a missionary in Malawi for some years and we started eight churches while we lived there. One of the churches was in a town called Chinsapo, a suburb of Lalongwe. And after some time, that church wasn't doing so well. The pastor had lost his passion the members were starting to gossip and skinder and complain and gripe and I was just getting ugly. I, tr I went there several weeks in a row and tried to straighten things out and they just, they weren't interested. They'd go soul winning on Saturday mornings but their heart wasn't in it. They'd show up for church and sing the songs and the choruses and it sounded right but God wasn't moving around. The Lord had just walked off. So, I tried to do what I thought was right. I called the church together and I said, you're done. We're closing the church. They didn't like that. They, they went to the village chief and said, make the missionary keep the church open. So I sat there at 9 o'clock at night in a Malawian village with the chief over a candle and all the other smaller chiefs, there's like nine of them sitting there and we're going back and forth in Chichewa and we're trying to, I'm explaining to him why I'm closing the church. He said, no, you can't do that. Can't do that. How can you close a church? He said, that's, that's wrong. You're, what a bad testimony to close a church. I said, what a bad testimony to have a church open, going through the motions and no real love for Christ. That's not what we're about. Better to close it down and show everybody how serious we are. He said, but pastor, you're wrong. He said, if you get in, the, in a minibus taxi 
And you're going to take people to, the town was Blantyre, five hours away. If you're going to go to Blantyre, you're stopping the bus halfway through the journey and making the people get out. I said, no, sir, your analogy's wrong. The people in the bus on the way to Blantyre are telling me they don't want to go there. They are telling me this is as far as they want to go. They're asking to get out through their actions. It would be wrong for me to keep them in the bus and take them all the way there against their will. It only makes sense if they're asking to get out to stop and allow them to get out now. And for the first time the chief said, that makes sense. <laughs> I think one of the greatest things we can, do, we can do to offend the Lord is to have an I don't care attitude towards Him and the things of God. He's just too, he's too special for that. He deserves better than that. He deserves better from us on an individual basis. I believe He deserves better from us on a corporate basis as a church. I'm going to state something again as I close. I've said this maybe years ago. Maybe I should say it more often. I'm not worried about a big church. I'm not. I'm not worried about having every seat full Obviously. I'd, I'd much rather have some people that really, genuinely are seeking God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. I, I believe this with all my heart that God will tolerate any number of mistakes that occur while you're making an honest effort to love Him. Nobody's asking for perfection. Nobody's asking that you just soldier on and never get tired. We do. You can be honest about that. We're not saying you have to always have that spark and lively and jumping around and bubbly. Not every day is going to be like that. But it can be real. The Lord can actually influence your everyday life. We need to work at cleaving unto the Lord. Keeping that first love. Remember then repent. And I'm going to take him serious. If he doesn't, he's better off to remove it. He's better off to remove it. Oh God, help us. Let's all stand if you would, please. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Would you please do what God's told you to do tonight? What do you need to do about this? Caleb is going to play something quietly. What do you need to do about it? Jesus said, remember. Remember.
I hope you understood tonight. This wasn't a sermon to get you to do more. You understand that? Nobody said anything about doing more works. That never came up. Please don't take it like that. We spoke tonight about the reason for doing what you do. I charge you tonight to remember. Think about how good He's been. Think about what the Lord has done in your life. Think about where He brought you from to where you are today. Imagine for a second if He hadn't have found you. Oh, isn't it, isn't it special that He found you? Isn't that wonderful, the great shepherd of the sheep? He came looking for the lost one picked you up and put you on his shoulders and brought you home. Doesn't that mean something to you? Do you remember that? Remember him carrying you home? Remember how safe you felt? How special you felt? Feeling the Savior's arms wrapped around you? There's not one of us in this room that is immune from the waxing cold temptation. I'll put myself at the front of the front of the line. I have got to guard my heart. I don't want to do things mechanically. I don't want to be a machine. I want to preach to you folks because I mean it. Whether it's a good day or bad day, whether there's a hundred people or ten people. By the grace of God, I want to be genuine. I want it to be real. I'm going to pray and close the service just now. Would you consider one other thing in your heart tonight? You can't fall out of your first love if you've never been in your first love to begin with. If you've never been saved and fallen madly in love with the Lord, would you consider tonight that what He's done for so many of us, He can do for you as well. You saw it in the testimony. A man grabbed a Gideon's Bible. He met Jesus. And it turned his world upside down. Changed forever. He can do that for you. Before you leave tonight, please, please. If you seek Him with all your heart, you'll find Him. Ask Him to save you and He will. Father, thank You for speaking to our hearts tonight. Thank You, Lord. If I can speak personally, thank You for speaking to my heart. God, please don't take our candlestick. Lord, we want to shine bright for you, which means we want Jesus to be on display. Lord, we're not worried about numeric value. We're not worried about how much money we can make. We're not worried about how popular we are. We want to be pleasing to you, God. That's it. That's it. That's all we want. God, that's all we want. Oh, Lord, help us to love you the way you deserve to be loved. Help us, Lord. Remind us. Oh, God, we're so weak. Remind us. Help us, Lord, to cleave to you. Thank you for cleaving to us. Thank you for demonstrating your love each and every day. Help us not to take it for granted. Thank you, God, for reminders such as this tonight. Would you please send us home tonight, Lord, and not let us quickly forget what we've heard. Let it sink deep into our hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. 
Amen.